is Cecil Hogan. I'm president of the National Burglar and Fire Alarm Association. We welcome you today. We want you to learn something and perhaps grow your business, uh, perhaps not make a mistake that you otherwise would have made by learning from some of the people that helped build our business. They're going to tell you their stories and uh, we think you'll find it interesting. Thank you. I'm Mel Mahler with ADS Security. I'm really proud to be part of the electronic security industry and privileged to be the current president of the Central Station Alarm Association. I really respect and admire the work that Charlie Darsh and Ralph Sevenor are doing to preserve the memory of our early pioneers and entrepreneurs that built this industry. Thanks for letting me be part of this program. My name is Alan Fritz. I'm president of SEA, the Security Industry Association. Our association is very proud to be affiliated with this project where we are interviewing the builders of the alarm industry. We hope that you'll enjoy it too. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Ralph Sevenor. This is August 23rd, 2006. We're here on behalf of CSAA, Central Station Alarm Association, NBFA, National Burglar and Fire Alarm Association, and SEA, Security Industry Association. This is a project on behalf of ARIF. Uh, I'm here actually to introduce a friend of mine, Charlie Booth, and Charlie actually started a company, Suburban Theft Protection S uh, Services, in uh, Malden, 1963. Right. So you've got a lot of years of experience, and uh, we're looking forward to it. I'd like to introduce my partner, Charlie Darsh, uh, to continue. I'd like to introduce Charlie Booth. Charlie has been in this industry for 43 years, with his company here in the Boston area. One of the things that has astounded me is that he has cust had custom built his own controls in the earlier days and it was done and it was an evolution of a number of them from printed circuit work to the relays to the boards that he actually manufactured. And I'd like to introduce Charlie. Hi. Hi, I'm Charlie Booth from Boston Burglar Company. A uh, company I started in 1963. My initial alarms were uh, basically local stores, foil work. I buy my equipment from a Demco um, and uh, did no uh, residential work. In fact, hardly anybody in, in those days was doing residential alarm systems. Uh, and it wasn't uh, until a couple of years later after I'd done a number of commercial alarms that my customers wanted alarms for their homes. So there wasn't much available. I think a Demco had, uh, had one uh, residential uh, control panel, but uh, I don't believe I ever bought one. But what I used to do was adapt some of the commercial equipment for use in homes and uh, there began the evolution of, uh, of my uh, making of uh, control panels uh, basically to the features that I wanted that I didn't see out on the marketplace and of course the other thing was I can make them fairly cheaply by uh, buying the individual components. I mean, one of my first panels uh, consisted of relays that and selenium rectifier transformer uh, sensitive relay all purchased through a Demco and I buy uh, uh, 12 um, five in a box and I'd uh, stack them up in my shelf and would um, assemble these things and this particular panel was uh, made on masonite and that's idea I got from the way Ben Call used to do it so uh, I would drill my holes or mount my uh, transformers, uh, the selenium rectifier and the relays and so forth, terminal strip, and this panel was for a residence. And in those days we would put a lock and a red light outside the front door and there no time delay entry exits. And this uh, panel was uh, basically a workhouse, did very well. but. And each of the uh, soldered connections were made uh, one at a time, obviously, by me <coughs> in my workshop. And if um, a particular design needed an extra relay, then I was able to do that. I'd make the board a little bit larger. But there were problems with this in that <coughs> it took up a lot of time to, to do the soldering. So I decided there had to be a more efficient way of doing it. 
and we have the next evolution, same setup, <clears throat> but we have a cable in here that was laced on a breadboard and then the cable was placed in the uh, pre-mounted uh, relays. The plastic came from a customer of mine, the sign company. Easy to drill, easy to tap holes. <clears throat> and again, this required uh, the lock on the outside. There were no time delay entry exits. Well, there were problems with, it, with this because my employees who all took a, a shot at building these things uh, they would lace it too, they pull the lacing too tight and create short circuits or they get the wrong wire attached to the, uh, the, the lug. So there had to be a better way. And uh, along towards that better way, I came up with a time delay entry exit feature, which required these time delay amperite tubes, which allowed the customers to get inside and outside the house, I mean in and out of the house, within a certain time frame, didn't require a lock outside the front door. And uh, this basically was the same configuration as the previous boards, but with the addition of the time delay entry exits and a relay for uh, police connections uh, line reversal. But then I had the same problems in that uh, the lacing, getting the wires attached to the wrong lugs, and I went on to the next iteration which was <coughs> printed circuit board and this is the panel that uh, I developed um, made from scratch and this printed circuit board <coughs> was uh, came from this little contraption here which was or which is a, um, a silk screen I would buy the silk screen like this. I would then, um, with a film that you could buy in rolls, cut the um, circuits in. Then that would be applied to this. And when the time came for Um, transferring that image onto here, you would take this um, copper clad, place it in here, bring this down, and then there was a, a resistor you would put in there, black gunk, and you would squeegee it on, and you would take it off, let it dry, and at some point it would go into an etching solution. When you took it out of the etching solution, <clears throat> it would look like this. And this is a small add-on fire uh, panel. And <clears throat> again, this is what we had. Got the solder connections in the back. You have the driller holes in the copper clad. Mount the bases for the relays. And again, this is basically the same, uh, same setup as some of the uh, previous boards with the time delays, uh, police reversal, on and off, selenium rectifier, six volts. When I, <coughs> that was in 73. Uh, a few years later I <coughs> made up a screen for a three zone uh, panel for subdividing uh, the motion detectors for example and to talk to these panels, particularly the ones with the zones, uh, I would make up a uh, um, a panel like this, uh, the light emitting diodes, you push the buttons, you turn the system on and off, you could bypass them, I'm sorry, you could bypass the zones, when the, uh, the alarm rang, one of these lights would lock on, so when the customer came home they would know which one which one of the zones trip? That's one with a chrome. <coughs> this was a simple two zone uh, that would switch off a couple of relays for bypassing zones inside the house. <coughs> to uh, 
eliminate the lock, one of the first things I uh, did was to install combination locks inside the house. And this is a DTI keypad. And the configuration that came from the factory was simply uh, the face and uh, a red and a green light. But uh, I would take these uh, apart and uh, make them into two zoners by adding two LEDs on the top. So that when you push this button down here, <coughs> you would turn on or off zone one, this one for zone one and two. Um, so for many years <coughs> my employees got involved with the etching, the soldering, they knew the controls, the one that were out in the field they could do uh, on, on site repairs because they they knew how the panel was constructed and all of my circuits, protective circuits were feed and return double loops so that you could take uh, and service it quite easily uh, just by standing in the control panel and determine whether you had an open or a close or a shot but somewhere around 18, uh, <coughs> 1985 uh, we decided to stop making these ourselves because of the expense of keeping the employees uh, in the shop instead of out on the field and the cost of the uh, materials was getting too high you could go out and buy control panels for a lot less money and that's when I began using uh, Gataway CU66 a control panel that uh, um, I still have many in operation Hello my name is Ralph W. Sevenor today is August 23rd 2006 this is a joint project between SIA, Security Industry Association, CSAA, Central Station Alarm Association, and NBFA, a National Burglar and Fire Alarm Association. It's a project under the auspices of ARIF. I'm pleased to introduce Peter Ramonde, and Peter's been in the alarm business, electronic security, <coughs> since 1956. And what happened was, is at the time, he was looking at motion detection, and, and there really wasn't true motion detection technology. So in 1958, uh, Peter formed a company called Centenar. Uh, that then became another company uh, which introduced a product called Sonoguard, which is a Doppler effect motion detector. Uh, today what we're going to do is we're actually going to be bring Peter Amande in and Charlie Booth, who are, who are old friends, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to both Peter and Charlie. Peter? Charlie. Uh, Peter, uh, Peter Amande and, and I, uh, Charlie Booth, uh, we've both been in the burglar alarm, fire alarm business for 40, 50 years. Uh, we both started not knowing each other. Uh, Pete has his story to tell, I have my story to tell is how uh, we got into the business. Um, and we met actually through joining the Alarm Association here in Massachusetts. In fact, we helped uh, put the first one together in 1972 and it evolved into um, uh, the Massachusetts uh, Systems Contractors Association as it's called today but uh, during that time between 1972 and last year the name change went uh, through several iterations uh, but basic, basically the members that started in 1972 uh, continued on into the new association and that's how Peter and I got to know each other and um, uh, become friends and I think the association uh, has uh, has um, resulted in um, uh, us learning a lot more <coughs> about techniques that um, that uh, we would not ordinarily have known if we had continued to work on ourselves. Um, so Peter, why don't you start off with uh, how you get started in the business? Well, I actually got started because my wife got pregnant and I needed a job right away so I had to leave school. And by the way, not to interrupt, <laughs> Peter's been married for uh, 61 years? No, it'll be 60 next year. 59 oh, 60. years. 59. Okay. Well, I'm lucky, that's all. But anyway, back to that, <coughs> when I decided I need a job, I went out and looked for a job. I, Sunday paper, I remember, picked it up. And in them days, they call us people burglar mechanics. I don't know why, but that was there. So it was an ad for a burglar mechanic training. And I went out and looked at it, and I was with uh, Murray Simon, who had a, an alarm company called, uh, what? 
Was it Ace? Ace Salam in Revere. <clears throat> and I worked with him for the first five months of my career in this business. Wasn't a hell of a lot to learn then. It was strictly all mechanic. We made our own screens as, as uh, Rich mentioned earlier. Made all, everything, made all the contacts all by hand. Everything was made by hand. And then it was all hard, went, hard wired in. I left him in the sixth month and went to work for Ben Call. A little more organization with Ben Call. He was more sophisticated in his alarm systems. <clears throat> he made his own. We were hired to work one night, one week of nights and three weeks of days. So at night, everyone that was on the night shift would make these screens that we had to make. <clears throat> Only, uh, and then, just like Rich uh, had mentioned, it was a process of embedding wire into the wooden slats, then dipping the whole process in a tank to coat it. And uh, those would go over mainly for windows and doors. And uh, I worked for them for maybe about a couple, three years on and off. And uh, behind me at my mind all the time, I said there had to be something more than just a window contact and foil. Out there, they got to be somebody that's thinking about using something to actually catch someone moving in the place. And there was. The first guy, Bag No Alarm, made that first ultrasonic. I had an opportunity to go to the factory and meet him and see it. But it worked to a certain extent, and then it would create alarms on its own, you know, during a week. Maybe about a month after you had it in, you'd have a few problems. So it was never stable enough. I had the good fortune to meet a, another gentleman in 1958 <clears throat> who um, was an electronic genius. And he was working on a product, he told me. Now, we met at Dunkin' Donuts over a cup of coffee and <laughs> spent the whole night there. Finally, they threw us out. But what he had done is he had worked on a system and he had a prototype of detecting motion using microwave. I couldn't believe I was seeing this. It was the first time I ever saw what I was looking for, and we had it. It was a, we made our own, just like Charlie did, we did the same. Everything was relays, tubes, and uh, it was a 110 volt uh, fed. But it was practical. The motion detector was stable. It would detect people moving in a radius of 30 feet. Uh, for the most part, it would stay in the building. Uh, you didn't have to shield it up as much. And, uh, but it was cumbersome. It was a big, big box, like a big bread box. The detectors were kind of big. You could only put two of them on at a time. And we decided we needed to find something a little more stable than that. We were lucky. We, were, we had a small office in Somerville. A salesman dropped in one day and he had a device. He didn't know what to do with it, but he thought maybe we did. So it was a little sauna that they had just come out with, made a little turn. And my partner, like I said, who was a genius, developed by taking that and changing some part of the crystal, he was able to make a motion detector that had a, produced a, a very high frequency sound. You could actually hear it. And, uh, but it was stable. It, would, it was a Doppler effect, it would go and come back, but you know, and it took a lot for this thing to ever fall sound due to the environment. And as a result, it was the first breakthrough, I think, in the whole industry of using a motion detector that was stable, that was stable enough to make them and put them in. Um, well, we just went on from that and just improved the product as we went along. We made a device that was uh, in a portable form, weighed 40 pounds with a handle on it. it. It had two things that looked like speakers on it. The upper part was the detector, the lower part made the noise. And that was another big breakthrough. <clears throat> we were having lunch one day across from the Boston Navy Yard. And the destroyer was backing out of the yard. And when destroyers make a turn, they have an air horn they put on. It whoops the right line, everyone to grab a hold of something because when they made a quick turn, everyone would fall over. They didn't. And it was a whooping sound, but a strong, strong, strong. And I remember saying to him, 
That is the sound we need for our alarm. We kicked it around for a little while. Two weeks, two weeks later, he was able to develop the sound that we had that everyone uses today, which we nicknamed the whooper. Um, can't say much other than we never had an opportunity to protect ourselves with any patents at all. We never had enough money to put together to do that, so we just went on and produced it and sold it. And never had too many business sense, not too much business sense that could continue with it. We, we made a lot of mistakes when we handled the device, but it was out there, and it was the beginning, I believe, of the breakthrough that the industry needed. Uh, what happened to that company? They finally went out of business in 70, actually in 76. They were bankrupt in 75 and went out of business in 76. But the, the innovations that were there and went back into the industry, I think did a, a great job in getting other people to think about what they could do with this and how far you can go with motion detection. All of those devices up there all started because of that. Uh, and the, the best part about it is when Charlie and I got together with this association. That was the other thing. Uh, I loved what I did. I ate and slept it, just like this guy did. And I don't think I would ever change anything other than if there was more than 24 hours in a day, I'd take that. Uh, it was great. We, I, f I really had a good feeling, so did he, that what we were doing was good and we wanted to do it better. But we needed to get ourselves together. There were too many al little alarm companies springing up and there were kids that knew how to wire a little bit. They were mostly wirers. They had a little electrical background and they could go to a Demco at that time and buy anything they wanted to put together. But they didn't know really what they were doing. Not most, most of them didn't know exactly what they were doing. They would throw it up and make a lot of mistakes sometimes. But the association is what we needed. We needed to get together, talk to each other, which they never did before, and, and get to know what we were doing wrong and do it all right all together. And I think that really happened. This took a long time to do it, that's all. I'm, I'm talking a blue streak here, Shelley. Uh. <coughs> I get into the business in uh, 1963 <clears throat> um, quite by accident. It wasn't something that I had uh, wanted to do. Um, I know I graduated high school in 1954 and between 1954 and uh, uh, 1963 I had an assortment of odd jobs. I worked for I worked in shoe factories. I did body work. Uh, I sold vacuum cleaners. <laughs> Uh, and I worked for two good um, electronics companies. One was Laboratory for Electronics on Portland Street in Boston. Another one was the Northeast Scientific Corporation in Cambridge. And that's where I learned to uh, uh, wind transformers, epoxy transformers, um, solder, um, lace, uh, all of the usual things uh, that are associated with assembling um, um, small electronic components. And uh, in high school, I had a, uh, uh, I took all the business courses, uh, accounting, and, um, and one thing I was glad I took was typing. I had two years of typing, so that helps today in, uh, in the use of the computer. But I, in any event, I, uh, in 1963, and for a year or so prior to that, I was working as a bookkeeper office manager for a one-man uh, office <clears throat> and for a uh, contractor who built uh, homes, concrete foundations, apartment buildings, and so forth. And we had a um, burglary on one of our job sites. And again, this is in the 62-63 uh, area. And in calling up some alarm companies from the um, Boston Yellow Pages, and there were only about 10 or 12 companies uh, doing business uh, in, in the Boston area, um, uh, Pete doesn't remember it, but I think he was one of the companies that I had called and I remember him coming into the office with a microphone stand and a dipole antenna, which was his um, microwave. Uh, microwave unit. And uh, But we didn't do business because it was one of those items that was hard to um, uh, transport and set up. And uh, uh, But anyway, one of the salesmen uh, showed me an automobile alarm that he had and um, I don't know who made it or where it came from but uh, 
the wheels started to turn and I decided, gee, uh, I like to sell those, um, get away from this desk job which was paying me two dollars an hour and my thinking was if I installed auto alarms then I could charge, uh, uh, you know, sixty nine dollars for example for an installation and uh, a couple of jobs and I'd have uh, uh, my eighty dollars for the week. <clears throat> so he told me about a Demco and I wrote to them uh, <clears throat> and they sent me a catalog. This happens to be a 1967 catalog, but uh, obviously I was looking at a 63, 1963 catalog, and I ordered um, a half a dozen of these uh, auto alarms, and anyway, I got myself a telephone number and answering service, and uh, <clears throat> I call myself Suburban Theft Protection Services, and um, I installed a few of these, and then a friend of mine, uh, who had a clothing store wanted to know if I could uh, install an alarm in his store and I said oh sure <clears throat> and the reason why I said oh sure is because in the back of the catalog <clears throat> there's a description of the protective circuit and it uh, showed uh, how to connect the photoelectric eyes and tamper switches and floor mats uh, and foil and all of that so I foiled his windows <clears throat> never having worked for, uh, for another alarm company and never foiled before. Um, that, uh, I don't know, I probably got a couple hundred dollars for the job, <clears throat> but never had a false alarm. And uh, uh, maybe a month or so after that original installation, uh, there was an SH Green Stamp store next to him. This was in Saugus, Massachusetts, on the, on the turnpike. <clears throat> and SH called a um, wanted me to put in an alarm, like the one that uh, it was in the clothing store. So I did, uh, I put foil on all that plate glass window, put in a Demo control, and uh, then I got some more calls from s to do their other stores. And suddenly I found myself in the business, uh, mostly commercial, <clears throat> in fact all commercial. And uh, the I did the 7-Eleven stores. When they first moved into uh, the greater Boston area, they were literally from 7 in the morning to 11 at night. And I put in identical the controls there and foiled all the windows, the bell on the outside. Uh, none of this was centrally uh, connected. And, uh, uh, but uh, when I lost those um, accounts, when they went 24 hour, <coughs> I was glad because uh, repairing their foil brakes was um, was a big headache, uh, always going down to those stores. Um, so uh, I had added, I had a small ad in the um, yellow pages. It was called Suburban Theft Protection Services, a one inch in column line. And <clears throat> I would say for uh, a one year period, I received maybe a total of 10 calls. And at the end of that uh, uh, year, I decided that, uh, gee, I, I either got to work for somebody else or, um, or get a uh, salesman to uh, um, sell my job because I really wasn't a salesperson. And anyway, I decided to change my name to Boston Bird Alarm Company and to take out a quarter page ad in the Boston Yellow Pages, which was twice as large as anybody else at that time. Uh, ben Call had a quarter, uh, an eight-page ad, uh, Hyde Park Alarm, <coughs> and a couple of others. And my thinking was that if I put the quarter-page ad in there, then when people went to the book, they would at least give me a, a call for competitive bid. Well, it's interesting, when the book came out in January of, um, I think it was 65, <laughs> And that book came out in January. Instead of getting 10 calls for a year out of a small one-inch in-column ad, I was getting 10 calls in a day. <clears throat> and again, I was doing commercial work. And after uh, uh, a few years of that, my commercial customers wanted me to install alarms in their homes. Well, I had to uh, adapt and design and figure out how best to um, uh, provide uh, protection for for homes. And um, I'll um, 
give you a demonstration of some of the panels that I, I put together a little bit later. But uh, that's basically how I got into the business. And um, somewhere along the way, we decided in 72 to um, uh, join an alarm association or put together an alarm association. Uh, Peter, what would you uh, like to uh, uh, to do different? Looking back, uh, anything? <laughs> a few things. I can't say on a camera that I don't say anything. Oh. No, the association was the biggest thing uh, aside <laughs> of running our business. We were, we were devoted to running our business, and also every minute we had after hours, we could squeeze in. It was the association, and many nights, even after when we had. A group meeting. Charlie and I would pull back to the diner in Medford and, and spend the rest of the night again discussing various things in the what we could do to get everything going, what we could do to increase the, the membership and the association, get these people to come in and talk to each other, and then everyone was going to benefit by it, by the experience of every everyone else joining in one part. Matter of fact, Charlie made one of the things he made up at one of these meetings we had. It was a badge, and it, we're going to get these out to everyone we knew. Uh, I think the idea came from you. It was sort of a joint. Uh, yeah, stop crime, <clears throat> and it had the name of our association in. And we did. We Charlie made up a whole, make several hundred of them things, and we gave them out. But it was things like that, getting the word out, that got the people finally to come in. And through that, I think, like I said, everyone started to talk to each other, how they felt about using various types of equipment, what's your experience with this and that, and whether they realize it or not, everyone benefited by it. Uh, the, um, the evolution of the Alarm Association here in Massachusetts uh, was born, uh, well actually the idea was born back in 1972 at the uh, Essex Hotel here in Lynn, and it was a meeting that brought uh, all, uh, all the local alarm companies together, not all of them, but uh, uh, whoever was in business was invited to this meeting. And the central station companies were represented. And the purpose of the meeting was to um, uh, address legislation that was pending in the, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts legislature that was affecting our industry, and they in effect wanted us to be licensed. Well, at that time, we were not licensed and uh, it was understanding that uh, we could do our work without having to be a journeyman electrician. And it was because of this licensing that uh, we were brought together and it was from that meeting that the uh, Massachusetts Alarm Association was born and it was shortly after that that uh, we, we, came, we became an organization uh, again, Massachusetts Alarm Association, and then it went on from there, uh, various names, um, and uh, again, those members uh, fought off legislation, and there was a um, um, Salem injunction uh, uh, in effect that uh, was uh, subsequent to this meeting in 1972, I think it was a couple of years later, that um, the Board of Electrical Examiners had sent out a um, notice to all of the wiring inspectors in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that uh, alarm installers had to be licensed. And maybe a year or so after that, uh, the wiring inspector in Salem evidently stopped a uh, installer. And from that point, um, the Massachusetts Alarm Association um, um, in effect sued the Board of Electrical Examiners um, the courts um, gave us an injunction against the Board of Electrical Examiners from interfering with our work, and that uh, injunction um, stayed in effect for, for many years, and the later when the Massachusetts Lam Association became the Massachusetts Security Contracts Association, uh, the MSCA uh, became a party to that injunction and we enjoyed um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, non-interference from the Board of Electrical Examiners. And then, of course, uh, uh, the fire marshals and the fire department got involved Supported. with uh, mm -hmm. wanting legislation to uh, <coughs> um, um, get 
fire alarm installers license because of the uh, false alarms and so-called shoddy work that was being done and then uh, the, uh, the electrical industry got involved, uh, Necker and Mecker, and then we got involved with joining this uh, group and eventually uh, chapter 141 got changed mm -hmm. and we now have uh, C and D licenses here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts giving us uh, licensing to uh, uh, um, take out permits for installation of alarm systems and uh, you know are you still still working the uh, <coughs> the the licensing board was looking at their their code but they didn't look good enough they didn't want to there was like a, a, in the first couple of pages it says anything below 50 volts was not considered in the book there were no rules for that and that was us below 50 <coughs> volts. So they lied to everyone when they said, because they saw our industry growing, they didn't want us to, they wanted, us, they wanted to grab us, so to speak. They needed more people in, in their industry. And that's what happened when we, we realized that we, we didn't have to go along with them, but we had to go to court to prove it, that's all. And we did. New ideas. Uh, well, you're not okay. in the business anymore, are you? No, I'm retired oh, now. Okay, aren't you, aren't you lucky? <laughs> I just read about it now. It's, oh. it's nice. Um, the, um, there was some discussion recently about uh, some of the significant events that have occurred in uh, our industry over the years and how things have changed. And, um, you know, going back into those early 60s, I. <clears throat> you know, things that happened like the demise of the McCullough Loop and direct wire to police and and that Cataform decision that uh, I've mentioned uh, from time to time was a very important decision for um, uh, many manufacturers, um, companies that wanted to uh, <coughs> manufacture phones and also right. alarm equipment, be able to attach that alarm equipment to the telephone line. Right. In and those early right. days it was a no-no. We used to uh, secretly uh, tap into the phone line somewhere in the house yeah, so, they so that the phone company wouldn't <laughs> know about it. And um, yeah. then uh, uh, the reporting uh, was by uh, tape, the old uh, telephone tape dialers. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there were, um, uh, what was after that, a, um, digital slave dialers. Yeah, well, the Damco's receivers. Yeah, and then the digital receivers. Uh, the SIA format, it was a great format, we still use that today. And in, instead of buying slave dialers today, you bu it's all incorporated within the control panel. So mm -hmm. there are many advancements in the industry uh, in taking uh, and getting rid of some of that old... Uh, I think the one big thing, Charlie, to, to answer, you had, a, you had to be... Now, was if you sold them, anyone an alarm, you were selling also yourself and, and the yeah, equipment. Yeah. And that meant you were, and that was meant a lot. People would 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 rather see that than anything else. They, the price didn't matter as much as I want to believe in this guy that he's going to do this job for me. And when I call him two years from now or whenever, he's going to be there that right away within 24 hours, if not if sooner. And that I think is always going to be true. But no matter how this industry changes, the person behind the systems has to be a reliable. Has to you know, want to do for the customer, every customer, be small or big, the same thing, be there when they need us. <clears throat> and I think that made the play, I think that's what makes any company grow. I never had to have, I never had to have advertising. I only did it once when we went on the radio, which was a big thing, and the news thing at eight o'clock in the morning, we did that for three months and it increased sales. But after that, it was our reputation uh, people would word of mouth would tell people, look, call this outfit here, they do a good job. And it was. I never ever investigated, or rather invest, invested in advertising after that. And that, was in, that was about 1969 to yeah, about 1984. Yeah, right, and, right. and that advertising on the Boston radio stations it did the big thing. Made people aware of alarm systems. We, we caught everyone in their cars going to work <laughs> at 8, 8.30 in the morning and we, and we had this big spiel, which was very exciting. We used the, we used the device to the whooping sound as the the tape was surely about, it would say, pitch yourself, the middle of the night, someone's coming in, everything was quiet. They even had background music to that effect. 
then suddenly you move and the whooper would go off. Well, it was very impressive. A lot of people did call because of that. They want us to uh, talk about what we would do different. Looking back, I wouldn't change. I wouldn't change a thing. No, I mean, we had a lot of fun doing what we did. Yeah. And that's the other thing. In our business, you had to you had to really take it as you're very serious about it, but you're having fun and you're meeting people. That was the other thing. We met people we never would have met before. The industry would never look at each other this close. You could never ever uh, call a guy up and ask him anything until we actually came along and put this whole thing together. This this association. <clears throat> we used to hold, uh, we used to uh, meet in the uh, restaurants after some of the association oh, yeah. meetings and we'd talk about uh, anything and everything in the oh, industry yeah. and I remember one of our major complaints was the, and and I'm talking in the, in the, in the 70s now, yeah. the mid 70s, that uh, the major complaint was equipment that didn't function right, that well, false yeah. alarm. Right. And we were sitting around this table one time talking about the, with Freddie Tapper was oh, there, yeah. you Tapper. and me, and I think somebody else. And we came up with uh, an idea for forming a committee of the, in the Alarm Association uh, to look into some of these products so we could advise the uh, other people, uh, the other members, uh, mm -hmm. you know, what not to buy and <clears throat> what was the headache. So we coined an acronym called the SCRAP Committee. Yeah. <laughs> well, the SCRAP was, <laughs> was an acronym for a special committee to review alarm products. So everybody got a chuckle out of that, mm -hmm. and we actually got some calls from manufacturers, uh, and we got approval from the association to, to proceed. And then we began to realize that, you know, this is an enormous task, and we didn't have the time, <clears throat> and uh, there was liability involved, and uh, so it didn't go uh, much further than four or five months. Uh, we had manufacturers come in, though, and talk about their product, which they never would have done before. Yes. And, uh, well, you know, it, it helped a lot, mm -hmm. getting these people in and saying, you know, what they had. Of course, they, the feedback from us was important to the manufacturers. They could have never made any of this stuff here. They didn't have feedback from people like us. We used the product, we lived with it. <clears throat> Sometimes we didn't want to, but we did it. Matter of fact, we made improvements on the product and fed it back to the, the manufacturers and they, that's what happens. I really, uh, that was, I think that's the biggest thing we ever did in our industry is. is uh, talking to each other. Yeah, exactly. You have to. You can't be married without <laughs> talking to each other. What new ideas would you like to say? Anything? New, new ideas? Uh, I don't know. Well, I, I have found that um, <clears throat> the industry tends to um, feed on itself and take care of itself, and there are, there are people out there who are thinking of better ways to do things, and it's proven itself over the years that, uh, you know, you, you started out with uh, those crude products that we had uh, back in the 50s and 60s, sure. and the evolution uh, from uh, uh, the, the passive infrared detector, uh, you know, the ultrasonic uh, detectors to the passive infrared and then to um, the dual techs mm -hmm. and I think that or the, the use of dual detectors uh, is one of the greatest uh, uh, factors in reducing false alarms and um, uh, I continue to use uh, dual techs oh, yeah. uh, today. What, got, what's going to be uh, in the future? I haven't any idea. I'm thinking right now of a gentleman who just passed away recently. His name was Price. He worked for, for Carl's Alarm. There were three brothers. He was the last one to pass away. Uh, anyway, I can remember we were both servicemen at the time. <coughs> and uh, when you, most of the work, most of the service work at the time was because of foil. Foil connections either corroded or broken, and if they would they would be together like that, it's fine. A truck go by, it would vibrate, and the alarm would go off. So this kid here figured out, <clears throat> someone had told him, plug in 110 volts and to take the two wires and put it across, and it'll, it'll pop and tell you which one it was. He did it, he almost killed himself <clears throat> in place. I mean, it was an arc and a half that happened on the window. One. Anyway, it was just a funny thing that he had done. And then, that was, I laughed about that. The other story I got to very quickly is when we first went out with the SonarGuard, which is the portable unit, 
I saw one up on Route 3 of a small SO gas station. <clears throat> Matter of fact, that day I had five of them in my car, and I started from Somerville and went to Lawrence, and I sold every one of them to gas stations. They were a big market at the time, because they used to get burglarized, and they'd steal the tools to go down to the next guy and sell them to them. And the next gas station would buy them and not care about where they came from. But anyway, he had it in there about a week. It was set up on the lube, and the lube in a gas station is a great amplifier. You could, you could drop a diamond and it sounded like you dropped a, a bowling ball. And one night this kid broke in, a young fella, and this thing caught him, and it, when this thing went off, this whooping sound had a skin effect as well as being very loud. If you were in a room like that, you'd feel this up against your face really hard, like someone was going to hurt you. And instantly he wanted to get out, and he dove right through the small window they had in the office. It was about, oh, maybe about eight by four. And he just went right through the window while he got cut. There was a little blood there, but, and, the, and the gas station guy was elated there. So it was nice. The, um, you got a funny one? Well, no, when you were working uh, for yourself, uh, yeah. when you left uh, Sonogard, um, Those are good years you, you, you hired employees, I assume? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And what was the most you ever had? Uh, I had about 14 <coughs> guys working at one time. Yeah, we, we did, at uh, one time we grew pretty fast, but we, I gotta say this, if anyone asks me today, how would I get in the business? Or what should I do before I go in business? because I got a toolbox and I know everything I need to know about the alarm business. Mm -hmm. I go back to school and learn what business is about. Mm -hmm. Because without any business background, you haven't got a very good chance of ever making it beyond that toolbox. You're gonna be in that toolbox for the rest of your life. I don't care if you own the company or not. Because the business, well, especially today, you gotta know a lot. And if you don't know it, it just slows you down. I didn't know when I got in there about paying taxes, about having insurance and other things. Every time I, I came upon this, I had to stop what I was doing to try to teach myself about how to pay a tax, <coughs> uh, the insurance I needed, all that. So anyone out there, get, get a business background somehow or another. Either go to night school, day school, or whatever, and then start your company. I got lucky when I was in, go ahead. When I was, uh, I got lucky because when I was in school, yeah. I, you know, I had that accounting. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, you had a great background. <coughs> I wish and, I had yours. And of course, working in the office, uh, the contract, that helped a great deal too. So You're a fine it, example of what I just said. Yeah. Really. But I, I, I became a victim of my own uh, personality in that um, things had to be done right. They had oh, to yeah. be done my way uh, because I, my thinking was that, uh, um, uh, well, let, let me put it this way. I learned that uh, n your employees are not necessarily going to do right. the things the way you do them. Right. And <clears throat> as a result, um, I, I tried uh, uh, going the um, uh, salesman's route, hiring a, a salesman mm -hmm. here and there, but I found that <clears throat> I was becoming an arbitrator. I get to the job site, a salesman had said one thing to the mm -hmm. customer, said something else to the installer. Now there's an argument, well, well, I was going to get one of these and one of those, and I have to go there and arbitrate. Well, I got to the point where, uh, oh, and the salesman always sold the job for less than what I wanted to, to, to get, to, you know, I wanted a fair price. And I said, finally, I just gave up on the salesman and I've sold everything since then. Mm -hmm. So I would say 99.9% .9 of all of the jobs that I've ever installed, I designed, I sold, and uh, uh, I helped install. In the early years, I did all the installation, but uh, uh, the most I ever got was two crews. Um, and four employees doing that was enough for me. Uh, I, can only, uh, I can only do so much. So. I never got beyond that point, but uh, all of my employees did start making uh, um, the control panels that I had designed so that uh, it um, helped when they were out on the field. But I want to tell you a couple, couple things about one of my employees. Um, there's, there's a ton of stories about employees, the things they do or they don't do. And I had one, one guy, uh, two stories about this one gentleman. Uh, when the digital uh, communications yeah. uh, 
digital dial that came in. Uh, I bought a, I think it was a $4,000 big box from uh, Outfit in uh, Maryland, I think, Digital Communications. Mm -hmm. It was a receiver and a transformer plug-in and had some battery, uh, some uh, batteries inside. Uh, I think they were NICADs. And um, for some reason or other, I had to uh, change these batteries. And I didn't have the right connectors. I had some uh, Demco uh, <coughs> recharger packs or something. And anyway, I, uh, this guy's name was Pete, too, by the way, a young guy. And uh, he'd been with me only a few weeks. And I had asked him to uh, you know, cut the leads off of these batteries and connect those batteries onto the, uh, the leads that you're going to cut inside this unit. And he said, okay, good. So he took them down the, uh, the shop. He did a soldering. He brought them back up. And, uh, you know, I put the batteries in, hooked in the Molex connectors, and turned the switch on. Next thing you know, the smoke is coming up from this $4,000 receiver. Well, it turns out he had reversed the black and the reds. And uh, so anyway, um, uh, I had to buy another receiver. I didn't fire the guy, but... Um, I don't know. Uh, at some, Pete stayed with me for a few years. He was a, he was a decent worker. Yeah, he was him. always on the job. I met him. And um, one day he uh, was down uh, soldering connections for making control panels, and he came up to me. He said, "Charlie, uh, I, I want to go home. I'm not feeling well." And it was flu season, and he thought he had the flu. And so, oh, gee, Peter, I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, here, wait a minute. Let me. I opened my desk drawer, and I had a thermometer here. Put this under your tongue. <laughs> and go downstairs and a couple of minutes later come back up and let me see what the temperature is. So sure enough, he came up a few minutes later and he handed me the thermometer and I'm, I'm looking at it. I said, Peter, my God, you're still alive. You must be dead. It's 107 degrees up here. What did you do, hold it over the, th the, the, uh, the soldering iron? So I caught him dead in the act trying to uh, uh, feign an illness. Anyway, uh, uh, Peter stayed with me for uh, a couple of years or so. He's straight his life. He's on. passed on now. Yeah. But, uh, it, uh, mm -hmm. Employee stories are great. A lot of stories with people you And hide. false alarms and customers who think that uh, the noise that they hear is coming from the alarm system. Mm. And uh, you're pumping through the questions, well, is it the carbon monoxide detector? No, I don't have one of those. Um, uh, oh, it's coming from the motion detector. No, it's coming from the smoke detector. I, I know it's in this room. I had one the other day. She swore up and down it was coming from my smoke detector. And I said, uh, Renee, those smoke detectors don't make any noise. That's the vintage of the smoke detector. Uh, there are no horns built in. And uh, so I decided, look, I'll, I'll come tomorrow, figuring that she'd be home that night, mm -hmm. the night before, and would discover the problem without me having to make a service call. So, um, sure enough, she said, Charlie, you're a genius. There was a carbon monoxide detector behind the door in the basement. <laughs> but, um, yeah, there are a ton of reasons why customers call and they swear up and down that it's the alarm system. A lot of times they're, they're an alarm and the, and the clock would do it. A clock alarm. Would yeah, do it. I've had stuck doorbells. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> stuck doorbells. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's been quite an experience, I tell you. I, I wouldn't trade it for a bit. We made quite a bit of the Sonar Guide units. As a matter of fact, I would say uh, easily 2,500 of them. We uh, had got involved in distributorship, not knowing what we were doing. We had people pretty much all over the country in various states that would buy five or 10 and put them in. But uh, we didn't know how to handle that at all. It was It was just a a mess. But they did get out there and they're, they're probably still out there somewhere like these are. We sold an awful lot of them here. Uh, almost, you used to be able to go down the street and all you would hear in some of the streets was this hmm, this hum all the time on both sides because we had most of the business on the street. <coughs> and that's another advantage that they had. A burglar when he was going to knock a place over would go, you hear that? Yeah, go next door where he didn't have one. So it did a uh, it did a good job psychologically as well. Uh, Peter was president of the uh, Lamb Association. F what, what are you talking about? How many? Four. Four. Um, Peter was president of the uh, Massachusetts Security Contractors for a couple of years. Yeah. I was uh, president for one year. Yeah. I was secretary for a while. Oh, yeah. Edited the newsletter. All for the way. 
uh, did the bylaws, and Peter and I shared many committees. Uh, oh yeah, uh, a lot of committees. It was um, it was a rewarding experience. Oh, it was. And, uh, I think it was. It was rewarding to see the the members started to come in. <clears throat> yes, they really started to come in. They really started to talk to each other and trust everybody. Mm -hmm. That was it. That was really fantastic. Yeah, yeah we had some good people involved with us too. Yes. Not around now, but yep. we had them then. Yeah, I think the association uh, um, was was one of the best things that yep. ever ever happened to us. Yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, point this out to you, Peter. When in the old days, uh, in the '63, '65, uh, I took yep. out a quarter page ad. I told oh, you. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I've advertised on the yellow pages ever since then. And in 1982, um, I elected to advertise in a section called the color pages which was a 16 page insert one, yeah. in the middle of the book and it was um, uh, well done and um, the the people Harry Quint florist was in there tech hi-fi underground camera uh, ITT technical Institute uh, joy tile city expert fence and valleys, remember valleys on Route One. Steakhouse, yeah. Uh, Pizzeria Regina, uh, and I took out an ad too, and that's the ad here. Uh, cost uh, twenty-two thousand dollars for the year, but I never paid that. I only paid about fourteen thousand because I refused to pay the twenty-two because the telephone company did not um, push the yeah. color pages. All I had was a little bit yeah, of logo right. here. So, but I did have a reference in my quarter page ad to that. Yeah. And one of the nice things about uh, the color page ad is that it pre-sold the people. Well, yeah, if you read it, yeah. If people you read, read it, it and then when I got to the job site, then uh, they were already sold.